Uh, have you ever rewatched a, a movie or reread a book that had a surprise ending because you wanted to go back and see what clues did I miss along the way of this surprise ending? Did I miss that there was kind of a foreshadowing that this was going to happen? I've done this a couple of times. I've rewatched a movie uh, that I enjoy, and now that I know the surprise ending, I'm looking for the clues of what is going to happen. And now that I know the end, I can have a little bit better understanding of what's happening throughout the movie. Now, the movie that sticks out the most to me in this regard is the movie Sixth Sense. And uh, I'm about to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it, but that movie came out in 1999, so it is on you and not on me, all right? But the big twist of that movie is that there's this child psychologist who is trying to help this little boy who thinks he can see ghosts, and then throughout the course of the movie, the psychologist, he comes to believe that the boy actually can see ghosts. But the big surprise, the big <clears throat> unexpected ending is that the, the guy is dead. And the reason this boy can see him is the boy can see ghosts, and he is a ghost. And it's really remarkable when you go back and you watch it because they really show you that he was in fact dead. In fact, the opening scene of the movie is him being shot. He, he dies in the beginning of the movie, but you just think, oh, he made it. And Nate Bergazzi, who's this comedian, he has this really funny bit about that movie. He said, back then when we first watched it, we didn't understand what was happening, but we knew that his wife didn't talk to him for like a year. And that was, it was easier to believe that she was just mad at him than to realize that he was dead. So we watched that movie and we're like, yeah, this is what marriage is like. It's just hard, you know, you get the silent treatment. But when you go back and you watch it, you can see all these indicators, all these clues that you missed the first time around. And what we're hoping through this series is that when you understand the, the overarching story of the Bible, you'll see how all of the pieces fit how it all comes together, how it makes sense. And having that understanding, you'll be able to have conversations with friends and neighbors. You'll be able to gr more greatly appreciate the gospel. And I want to give you a real quick example of how this happens. Last week we were in Genesis chapter 3, and we looked at Adam and Eve and the fall, and they eat of the tree, they, they introduce sin into the world, they immediately feel shame. And we looked at the fact that they made themselves aprons of fig leaves to cover themselves because after they sin, they have shame and they recognize that they're naked. And so they are, are ashamed and they're covering themselves. They're hiding. Pastor Eric, can you go get me a bottle of water? I can just already tell I'm in a struggle uh, with my throat. <clears throat> this is the season of the year. Uh, when, I, when I come home on an afternoon and I can see them harvesting corn, I just know my allergies are going to be uh, horrible. Uh, so that, that's what I'm experiencing. But Adam and Eve, uh, they, uh, they, they make themselves fig leaves. They make these aprons. And I talked about last week how if you've ever had an apron or you've had to wear like a gown at the hospital, it doesn't really provide ample coverage, right? At the end of Genesis 3, though, it tells us that God makes them cloaks or coats of animal skins, and what we know, because we read the rest of the Old Testament, we see that there are often, the, there's regularly these sacrifices of animals. And what we know is that what happened in that moment is there was the first sacrifice. An animal was sacrificed to take the atonement or the punishment for Adam and Eve's sin. And God not only clothed them by giving them clothes to wear, He covers over their sin with this sacrifice. The Bible is a book of books, but it tells one unified story. And the overarching story of the Bible is creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And two weeks ago, Pastor Eric showed us the story of creation. And last week we looked at the fall. And today we're going to look at redemption. And this overarching story of Scripture answers the four main questions that every faith, every religion must answer. Where do we come from? And why are we here? Why is everything so messed up? How do we fix it? And where are we going from here? And these four questions, these topics, they come up all of the time 
in real conversations. Now you might be thinking, I don't think that came up at all this past week. They won't come up in surface level conversations about the weather or sports. But when we have real conversations about what's going on in our hearts and in our lives, these questions are questions that everyone wrestles with. And when we're ready to talk about these issues and these topics with our unbelieving friends and neighbors, we'll see these opportunities pop up again and again. Week one, Pastor Eric talked about that first topic. He answered that first question, where do we come from and why are we here? Last week, we looked at how everything is messed up. We saw in Genesis chapter 3 how they committed the first sins, and there were all of these filters that were untruth. And today, we're going to look at how all of this gets fixed, what God has done about the fall. And this is not something that is brand new that is introduced in Romans chapter 3. It isn't that Scripture is going along and suddenly there's this surprise ending. But rather, from the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we're given glimpses and looks at what it is that God is going to do. What we find in Genesis chapter 3 is kind of just the highlight of all of this coming together. And as we read this passage of Scripture, there's going to be three words that you're going to see that maybe you don't use in everyday conversation. Justification, redemption, and propitiation. And propitiation is probably the word that you're least familiar with, and it's the most important idea that we'll cover today. And we'll get there uh, in just a little bit. But let's start in Romans chapter 3, and we'll start reading in verse 21. So make your way there. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Have you ever noticed uh, that everyone else is a horrible driver? I rarely hear stories uh, where people tell me about how they made a mistake, but we often hear stories about how the other person made a mistake on the road, how they did the wrong thing. Bill Simmons, who's a, a sports podcaster that I, I like to listen to, he, he refers to something as Little League Syndrome. Little League Syndrome is when you think that there are all of these reasons that everyone's against you because Little League parents are convinced their child is the best athlete in the world and the only reason they haven't won all their games is because the refs are unfair or the coach didn't give them the ample playing time or has them in the wrong position, right? Everyone thinks the refs are against them. I rarely hear people say, like, we won that game because of the refs, right? <laughs> but we regularly say we lost that game because of the refs. Everyone has a biased view of the world. And we judge others more harshly than we judge ourselves. And this is what Paul is dealing with in the very beginning of this passage. Because he's writing to a group of people who think that they're more righteous than everyone else. He's writing to a group of people who think, yes, they need God's forgiveness, but I have been obeying the law. And Paul is telling them, listen, the law shows us that all of us, all of us are desperately in need of grace. None of us are able to keep all of the rules. 
he's making the argument that we are all sinners. He's showing us that the law of God demonstrates that none of us are able to keep the law. None of us are perfect. And he comes to this, this point in 3.23 when he says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's important for us to recognize that we have all sinned and fallen short of that standard. Because we often measure ourselves against everyone else. We measure ourselves against the other people in the room or in our family or in our circle of friends or on the news or in the world, whatever it might be. We're judging ourselves based on everyone else's conduct or level of morality. But Paul is saying we've all fallen short of God's glory. And that is the standard that we must meet. Years ago, Johnny Cash released an album, American Recordings, and it's him standing with two dogs in a field. And when someone asked him about this album, he said the two dogs symbolize the two phases of my life. Because the dog on his right is all black with a white spot on his face. The dog on his left is an all white dog with a black spot on his face and neck. He says, the early part of my life, I was bad. I wasn't even trying to be good. But even in that part of my life, there was a little bit of good in me. He says, in the second part of my life, I've tried to be good. I've tried to do the right thing. But even when I try to do the right thing, I try to be good, there's still a little bit of bad. I can never be completely one or the other. When we try to be good, we can't be all good. When we try to do right, what the law of God shows us is that it's impossible for us to keep it all. So we satisfy ourselves by saying, well, I'm better than most people. And perhaps that's true. I don't think that the 40 or 50 people in the sanctuary this morning are the 40 or 50 worst people in the world. You might be among some of the best. I think you're pretty great. I love you, but the standard is not, are you better than most? The standard is the glory of God. And scripture says that we have all fallen short of that. When I was in school, our school competed in this annual arts competition. And I I played sports, and so I was often involved in that. But at the end of the school year, they would have this arts competition where there were things like drama and and drawing and uh, and singing. And we had a teacher that, like, this was her passion, was this competition. And she would make sure that we had an entry in every, every competition. And she convinced me to compete in a couple of art categories because she said, nobody really competes in this. If you'll just make a submission, there's a pretty good chance that you'll place and it'll earn the school points. I didn't have to be good. I just had to enter. That's how she convinced me to compete in this category. And I got recruited because I wasn't singing. I wasn't doing any of the other stuff. Sometimes we think, well, if, if maybe I can get in on a technicality. Maybe I can find a slot that nobody else is going to fill. It doesn't work that way. There is a standard. And that standard is perfection. It's God's holiness. It isn't good intentions. It isn't we're trying our best. It isn't that we're better than most. When we look around, we might think that the competition is not that stiff for being righteous. That there's not that many people who are worried about meeting God's standard. And these people that Paul is writing to, they were better than most. They were more religious than most. But he says, we've all fallen short of God's standard. And that's the reason that we need these three words that we're going to talk about today. Redemption and justification through propitiation. Let's look at justification first. Verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. When we think of the word justified, We usually are most likely you're thinking of what people do when they're attempting to excuse their actions. When they attempt to justify what they have done. 
They attempt to minimize what they've done or shift the blame or guilt to someone else. If you're a parent, you, you hear attempted justifications all the time. He started it. She did it first. It wasn't my fault. It's not that big of a deal, right? These are all ways to justify what we've done. All of that started with the fall. We see Adam and Eve doing this in the garden. It was her fault. It was the serpent. In our modern culture, we've taken what started in the Garden of Eden and we have perfected it. We are better at shifting blame and avoiding shame better than any other generation. We figured out all kinds of ways to defer blame and sidestep guilt. We have professions of people that we can pay who will convince us that what has happened in our life is not our fault. It's just the result of our upbringing or our context or our culture or our family of origin. We've engineered our culture to be such that we don't think that anyone should feel any judgment or critique. And even in the church, we can come to think, well, because we want to be welcoming and loving and inclusive, we should never give anyone a critique and we should never talk about anything that causes people to feel shame or guilt or would designate anyone as being in the wrong. All of this is simply an effort for us to justify ourselves. You see, we're all desperate for justification. We're all desperate for someone to make it seem as though we have done nothing wrong. The justification that's offered in the gospel is not like any of these other justifications. It's not a half measure. It's not based on minimizing your sin or making you look better or making others look worse. The justification that is offered through the gospel is total, full, and complete. It's because it's offered through Jesus Christ. And it's such that when you have it, you are able to stand before God just as if you had never sinned. You're able to come into His presence blameless and perfect. We believe in instant justification, which means that when you put your hope and trust in Jesus, when you come to believe the gospel, that in an instant it is like you never sinned that all of your sins are completely and totally forgotten. It tells us that God forgets about them, that He throws them as far away as the East is from the West. There is a never-ending gulf between God and the sins that we have committed. Our slate has been wiped clean. We believe that if you experience that instant justification, that if you were to die in the very next moments, that you would stand before God and there would be no record of your sin. Justification. Listen, at Faith Church, we are to be welcoming and loving and inclusive, not because we're justifying ourselves, not because we're minimizing sin, not because we're blaming everyone else. We are to be loving and welcoming and inclusive because God has justified us. And we know that just as He has justified us, He can justify anyone. They can experience this wonderful, this wonderful blessing that their sins are wiped out. We believe that anyone who places their faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ is justified. This verse says that we are freely justified. And that means that it's free to us. But that doesn't mean that it was free. Because the price was paid, just not by us. And that idea comes in the idea of redemption. Justification can happen because of redemption. Redemption carries with it the idea of payment. And there's a foreshadowing of the idea of redemption in the Old Testament. In Leviticus 25.25, 25, there's a law that's established on how someone who has made bad choices or they've suffered great losses through an accident or unforeseen circumstances, how this person can pay their debts. Now, in our culture, we have what's called bankruptcy, where you can declare bankruptcy because of 
bad decisions or unforeseen circumstances or some horrible thing that's happened to you, you are so far in debt you will never be able to repay. You declare bankruptcy and all of these debts are written off. Now, the truth is that in our culture, everyone kind of carries the price of that. That the pricing of everything carries with it that there are going to be so many people who don't pay their bill. And so companies charge uh, an extra premium so that that can be underwritten. And sometimes we have this idea like, oh, you just declare bankruptcy and it just disappears. Somebody's going to pay that bill, right? If we're not careful, we can think of it like kids think of it, right? When kids say, hey, can we get this? Well, we don't have money for that. Well, just write a check. Just use your credit card, right? That bill comes due somewhere. In Old Testament times, there wasn't bankruptcy. So if you found yourself in a predicament where you were so far in debt that you could never repay, you would be sold into slavery. You would become an indentured servant. You would give up your freedom so that you could earn back. You could pay back. So in Leviticus 25, 25, they set up what's called Goel. This is a person who would step up and pay your debts for you. And what it lays out there is that this person should be someone in your family, in your tribe, someone who's of your blood, who is willing to step up and pay your debts willingly. Not because they were forced to, but because you're a part of their family, they would step up and they would pay the debt for you. Right now in our Wednesday evening Bible study, they are studying the story of the most famous Goel. We have the story of this man and woman who leave Israel and they go and live in the land of Moab. While they're living there, they have two sons and those two sons meet women who are from Moab and they marry but then famine happens, and all of the men in this family die, and all that's left is Naomi, who was the mother, the wife, and her two daughter-in-laws. And the story follows Naomi and Ruth, one of her daughter-in-laws, who come back to Israel. And there, they have nothing. They've lost everything. All of the land has been sold. They're widows, and they're widows in an agricultural society. They were incredibly marginalized and minimalized. But they find Boaz. And Boaz is the Goel, or the kinsman redeemer. And Boaz says, I will pay the debts. And he not only pays the debts, but he marries Ruth. He not only pays off her debts, he gives her love and a family. And they have children together. And she becomes a part of the heritage and ancestry of Jesus. How does this happen? It happens because someone out of love and compassion steps in to pay the debts. And not only pays the debts, but gives her a family. You see, all along, God is showing us what He's up to. All throughout Scripture, He's showing us what it is that is coming. That He is showing us that He is going to take the punishment. He is going to pay the debts. He is going to welcome us in. And this forgiveness that He's going to offer, it's not only going to pay our debts, it's going to give us a family. It's going to welcome us in. It's more than forgiveness, it's justification. It's more than mercy, it's love and grace. Tim Keller has said, what God gives us is more than a judge saying, you're innocent, you're free to go. It's the judge saying, you're innocent, you're free to stay. You're free to stay. You see, we think of God forgiving us of our sins, and we miss the judgment. We miss the penalty. We miss the punishment. And if you were to forgive someone, but you never wanted to see them again, you might say, you know what, don't worry about it, just leave. But God doesn't say, you know what, don't, don't worry about it, just leave. He says, it's forgiven. You're welcome to stay. You have a seat at the table. How is this possible? Does God just write it off? Does God just allow us to declare bankruptcy? No. There's an important phrase 
that you need to see in verse 26. Verse 26 says that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is where the idea of propitiation comes from. There had to be a payment for the sins of mankind. Someone had to pay to make it right. It's the payment of the debt that is owed by sin. An example that I use in growth track, so if you've been through growth track, you've heard this. Imagine that after church today, you're getting ready to get in your car and go to lunch, and Pastor Daniel backs into your car, I damage it. And you say, Pastor Dan, this is awkward, but I need you to fix my car. And I go, I don't have the money, and I don't have insurance. Sorry. Right? And you're like, this is crazy. I'm going to have to sue the pastor of this church. And so we go to Boonville, we go to the courthouse, and I stand before the judge, and I say, Judge, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to. I, I just wasn't paying attention. I, I don't have the money, and I don't have insurance. I don't have any way to pay. And the judge says, Daniel, I feel sorry for you. I forgive it. You don't have to worry about it. I'm going to walk out of that courtroom saying, this judge is awesome. He is so great. He is so kind. He's so loving. But how are you going to feel? You're going to feel like, my car is still broken. Who is going to pay for this? Who's going to make this right? You wouldn't feel that the judge was great. You would feel that he was very biased and partial. You would feel that it wasn't just, that it wasn't fair, it wasn't right. God is a God of love, but He's also a God of righteousness. He is a just God. And so He makes it right by paying for it Himself. He's like a judge who says, Daniel, I see that you can't pay, and my heart goes out to you, but their car needs to be fixed, so I will pay it myself. That's what happens on the cross. When Jesus' blood is spilt, He is the once and for all final sacrifice, and it's when God pays the debt Himself. And this idea makes some people uncomfortable because they don't like the idea of God requiring blood, requiring Jesus' blood in this insane, rage-filled moment on the cross. And if you feel that way, let me help you that it's not God requiring someone else's blood. It is his own blood. He's not requiring someone else to pay. If you read through the stories of the, the mythologies and the Greek gods and the, the gods that many pagans worshipped, there would have to be blood spilt and they would sacrifice some human. Someone else would have to pay to appease the God. God himself pays. Jesus takes the sin of mankind on his own back, on his own shoulders, and pays for it with his own blood. And when you look at the cross, you see God paying the debt himself, and you also do see God's anger being appeased. That's what propitiation is. It's the appeasement of anger. It's the appeasement of a death. And you look at that and you say, I can't believe that God would get so angry. If you have someone in your life that you love, most likely there's been a moment that you've been angry with them, right? In fact, if you don't have anyone that you love, you never really would have reason to get angry. But if there's someone that you love and you care about, and you see them hurting themselves or ruining their life, throwing their life away, that would make you angry. And what God is angry about with sin is that it ruins people. It ruins lives. It damages souls and hearts. And God is angry with sin because He knows what it does to us. So God hates sin. And there must be a punishment, a penalty for it, so he pays for it with his own blood. This is propitiation. It's the satisfying, the appeasing of that 
anger. Something I want you to notice about this passage of Scripture is that throughout it, what we're told, we're shown that things are being revealed. Verse 21 says, apart from the law is revealed. The law shows us our sin. Verse 24 says, justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. There's a revealing and there's a demonstration. You see, the cross isn't just a payment for sin. It's not just the moment that God's anger and wrath is appeased. It's the big reveal. It's the big reveal. Not only that our sins are covered by the blood, it's the big reveal of just how good and righteous God is. That He can be the just and the justifier. He can be holy and also gracious. The cross is this moment where there is a demonstration that God is not only righteous, but He is incredibly loving. And it might so come as a surprise to you that God loves you and He wants you and that not only will He forgive you, but He will welcome you in. This might be a surprise ending for you, but the truth is that the clues have been there all along the way. And the cross is the big reveal, the big demonstration of his righteousness. And I think that if your life was like the Bible, where we could go back and we could read all of the details, I think what we would see is we would see a God at work all along the way. And what he wants is he wants in your life for there to be this moment, this grand reveal, where you come to realize that the cross is God's demonstration, not only of his righteousness, but his love for you. And that he appeases the debt of your sin and redeems you so that you can be justified. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.